Hello, everybody. Welcome to the CMA Connect. It's great to have you all here. Um, just a little housekeeping before we begin, and I introduce our wonderful guests. Uh, the Children's Media Association is run by volunteers, and we're always looking for members to get more involved and take on leadership and support roles. So please reach out to your local chapter or the national chapter if you're unaffiliated, if you're interested in doing some more. CMA membership perks include the job board, a video library with a lot of our great event, events like you are here tonight for, uh, our social media and mentorship programs and more. Please add your information to the CMA directory found on the website if you are a member. This is the best way to teach, keep in touch with all the contacts you've met at CMA Connect. So I'm just gonna add the link to the directory here in the chat. Hopefully you can all see that. And let's get started. So once again, hi everybody. I'm excited to be here. Um, I'm Kennedy Mangus. I'm the cadet manager, so I'm sure I'm a familiar face to a lot of you. And today we are doing our publishing panel and we have two great accomplished professionals from very different places in the world of children's publishing. So let's introduce them now. First up, we have Leslie Margulis. Uh, she is a award-winning author of the Maggie Brooklyn Mysteries the Annabelle Unleashed series, and several standalone novels, including We Are Party People, If I Were You, and Ghosted. Her novel, Boys Are Dogs, became the, the Disney movie Zap, starring Zendaya, which was 2014's most watched cable TV program among tweens. Wow. <laughs> Ghosted is currently in development with Imagine. Leslie holds a master's degree in social anthropology from the London School of Economics. She's tutored homeless children in New York and taught fiction writing to teenagers at 826LA and Rytopia Lab, 826NYC and Rytopia Lab. In a past life, Leslie worked at UNICEF, wrote for The Village Voice and Cosmo Girl, and ghost wrote for several pop popular mystery series. She also wrote the no movie novelizations for Toy Story 2 and The Night at the Museum, both New York Times bestsellers. A frequent visiting author and guest lecturer at schools and libraries, Leslie serves on the board of WAAC, Writers and Artists Across the Country, a nonprofit that brings authors to underserved K through 12 schools. She currently lives in Los Angeles with one rescue mutt from Costa Rica, a couple of kids and one spouse. More on Leslie can be found on her website, lesliemargulis.com. And we also have Alexa Waco, uh, she began her publishing career in 2013. She joined the extraordinary team at Soho Press in 2018. In addition to being an editor, she has also worked as a publicist, educator, and cheesemonger. Ooh. <laughs> if you're ever in need of galleys, a coffee pal, or encouraging word, reach out to her at awaco at sohopress.com. Welcome, both of you. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, Alexa, can you uh, elaborate on the cheesemonger thing? Uh, well, yes. Um, also, <laughs> Leslie, I just want to shout out like your your bio blew me out of the water. I sh I should have gone first, I think, so I didn't have to follow that. That's <laughs> no. I'm a lot older than you, so I've had time to do things. <laughs> so I, you know, I was like short and so nobody wants to hear from the editor. You know what I mean? So that's, that's <laughs> everyone wants the editor. <laughs> <laughs> cheese. I I did in in a in a past life. I I sold uh, cheese at a farmer's market. So I always like to you know, <laughs> that is a fun <laughs> fact that I'm you know I've, mm -hmm. I have more experience in just publishing, but that's really the most important one so gotcha thank you <laughs> you're welcome thank you Kennedy for asking um so I just want to start the evening I'm going to give both of you a chance to give a little overview of your career thus far mm -hmm. um basically I want you to answer the question how to how did you get to the point where you are now um Alexa why don't you start yeah I, I think mine's a little bit straight more straightforward not straightforward but you know um a pretty straight path into into editorial so like I said or like Kennedy said in my bio um I have been working in publishing for about 10 years now and I've actually only worked for two companies so for about the same amount of time and previous to my current job I actually started as a fellow at like um uh, while well, I was in, in doing my MFA program at a literary packaging company, which I, I feel like I won't spin out on now unless anyone wants to know about it later in the Q&A, but was a really kind of unique way to get into publishing. Um, and I wanted to pursue a more traditional path, you know, eventually. And I loved editorial. And that's what I worked in, you know, in, in, at um, at 
the literary packager. So I honestly just love the the folks at Soho Press who I had I had a lot of interactions with in various capacities and um, a job opening opened up and I applied for it and I've been there ever since. Um, and of course, like I have a very not surprising story about growing up and loving books. So like when, when, and you know, it's deeper than that, but that's kind of, you know, the straight, the, the, the long and the short of it. So when I realized that one could pursue a job making books, I was like, great, that's for me. So, yeah. Leslie, why don't you take it? So I always loved books and reading and thinking and always wanted to be a writer and didn't know how. I wrote for you know my school paper in high school and college. And actually, I'll tell this story. Why not? The night before college started, I thought I was going to be an English major. And I was very nervous about starting school. So I stayed up all night and read The Firm, which I hated. <laughs> and it convinced me not to be an English major <laughs> if this is what people are reading. <laughs> um so instead, I thought I'd do something practical, and I majored in government and sociology with a minor in women's studies, and thought I'd go into academia, which seemed also really great in a lot of ways. And then I graduated and realized I really just wanted to write fiction, and I didn't know how. Right. But I knew the publishing industry was in New York, so I moved to New York and found a job in publishing. My first job was in the contracts department at Bantam Doubleday Dell, which was owned by Bertelsmann at the time, which is now Random House. Uh, they're all merged <laughs> and still owned by Bertelsmann, um, the German media company. And um, I very quickly realized, I think on day two, that you know being in the contracts department was not where I wanted to be at all. Um, and seven months later, I got a job in the editorial department at Golden Books, which is also owned by Random House now. <laughs> but at the time, <laughs> it was independent. And I had a really great boss who taught me a lot about editing and writing. And then she left and went to Scholastic and I had another great boss. And both of them gave me writing opportunities. And the, the great thing about being a low level editor at a publishing house is there's a lot of like ghost writing opportunities mm -hmm. and, and a jump on that. And so I ended up writing uh, like a Barbie book, a Winnie the Pooh book. I started writing Sabrina the Teenage Witch and Lizzie McGuire. Uh, books, which was okay. And then the movie novelizations like Spider-Man, Men in Black, and, and that all kind of came and it was interesting. And then I realized, oh, I could actually quit my day job and freelance full time and work on my own fiction. So I did that. And then at some point I thought it's impossible to be a writer and it's just a horrible business. So I went to grad school for anthropology and moved to London and thought, I'll just get a PhD and be a professor. And then on day two of graduate school, I realized, oh, being a professor is really hard. Like, it's just as hard as being a writer, maybe harder. <laughs> you know, you're, uh, and, and there are no jobs, basically, in academia. So um, why not just do what I really, really, really want to do, if, if, you know. And uh, luckily, actually, the editors, um, my freelance editors kept calling me, you know, when I was in London. So I was able to freelance in grad school, too, and then kind of realized I could go back and freelance full time. And I wrote a book, I got an agent very quickly, and then that book was rejected by everybody, and I wrote another book and another, and it was only after four years of freelancing and four, three unpublished novels that I got a two-book deal with Simon & Schuster. And from then, it got a little easier, so. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I forgot oh, to mention so now this. I really <laughs> respect John Grisham and I think, you know, if I could write the film, that would be awesome. <laughs> I still, I don't think people are reading John Grisham in college level English courses. Are they? Yeah. I don't know. I, yeah. <laughs> but I, I don't like his children's books. I think they're really <laughs> oh, okay. But, his, you know, like there's something to it. And, you know, he, he read a hundred bestsellers I'd heard, you know, before he wrote The Firm. And that's pretty impressive. And, you know, as a, a snooty 18 year old, you know, who was so serious, I was like, oh, but, you know, I'm not going to sell out like that. But, you know, there, there's, I don't know, I like reading page turners. <laughs> yeah. Good mysteries. And, you know, so. Great. Thank you. So I wanted to know about uh, some of your favorite projects or one particular favorite project of yours. And Leslie, you start. Hey, great. So when I was a ghostwriter, um, I wrote some for some very popular mystery series. And if you write Nancy Drew and Hardy Boys, you're not allowed to admit that you write them because Simon and Schuster owns them. So I'm not going to say anything about that. But I loved writing those mysteries and I learned a lot. And I always wanted a mystery series of my own. So in 2010, when the first Maggie Brooklyn mystery came out, it was very exciting for me and a dream come true. And um, 
I'm currently working on a new mystery series. Oh, I'm currently actually adapting Maggie for television. I mean, just, you know, as a pitch. I'm writing the pilot and I'm going to pitch it for TV. And that's been fun and exciting. And it's great to revisit that after, you know, so many years. And it was just a three book series and I kind of wanted to make it longer. So I feel like, you know, Maggie has a chance at another life, which is very exciting. And then my uh, current pitch that I'm working on is also a mystery series because I really love mysteries and I haven't written one in, you know, like eight years. And um, that is kind of the Westing game meets Nancy Drew on Ritalin. And it's about a girl with ADHD and she finds out that her learning difference actually helps her solve mysteries. Um, and she learned a lot about her complicated family history, basically, and is set at an oh. indie bookstore in LA. Wow. So. Oh, wow. That's amazing. I love that. That's a great pitch. <laughs> cool. Um, I, Leslie, I agree with what you said a few minutes ago about wanting just having an epiphany about like, you're like, wow, being entertained is actually really good. <laughs> I, I wholeheartedly agree with you and I'm skipping ahead, but I do like that about uh, kid kid lit. I mean, that's a broad generalization, but I think there's a lot more opportunities just to be really fast paced and engaging. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. that's really, really fun. And that can be, you know, literature too. Um, yes. But my favorite project, I'll say, obviously I'm coming at it from a different perspective is, is Leslie, my relationship to books are, are different because I'm acquiring them. Um, I'm editing them with an author um, and I have a really small list. So like truly, really like I love all of my books in a different way, all the products, all the products that I've worked on. Um, and I have a small enough list and I think I'm early enough in my career where like it still feels like I have a really personal relationship with all of them. Um, and that's really, really lovely. I, I work for um, Soho Teen is an imprint of Soho Press. But we're an indie, we're an independent um, publisher and we're on the smaller size, not like teeny tiny, um, but we know we have about 15 people. So I think we all have that relationship with our, with our books because we do have a small enough company that we really do have a kind of one-on-one -on -one relationship. There are, there are few enough books that we can actually know them all really well. So I do love that aspect of my job. Mm -hmm. um, but I think if I had to pick one that's kind of like the, you know, really holds special place to me, it'd be my first acquisition at Soho Teen, which is called What's Coming to Me by Francesca Padilla. Um, I get to work with a lot of debut authors um, in it throughout my career. And that is always really rewarding and awesome. And this one is about a set, a teen girl who sets out to essentially take revenge on like a really shady boss of hers. And it's a contemporary story and there's a crime element, but it's not the traditional mystery thriller that like involves a murder or kind of like any of those mo more commercial aspects. And I really think that um, is really cool and unique and it's just an awesome book. Um, but it was my kind of my first one. And then um, when I was back in my previous job, I worked on a fantasy series that was my first big, book series that I ever worked on called Everless by Sarah Holland. And that was also awesome. I don't really have a chance to work with fantasy anymore, but um, that was really special and would highly recommend to any fantasy readers. So. Thank yeah. you. I, I love hearing how passionate you guys both are about the work you do. It's really awesome to hear. Um, this is a question we chatted about a little bit before, but what are your thoughts on the publish on publishing as an industry? What, are what excites you, what keeps you waking up in the morning and still in the publishing in uh, industry, and then what frustrates you? Yeah, I guess I guess it's my turn to go for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was saying like this, it, this is a really big question, so I feel like you yeah. can't tackle it all. You know, it's like, there's probably a really long answer to that question. Sure. It's always changing. Um, but, and I think also, Leslie, you and I have different perspectives on it, I'm sure, but on, on kind of like the editorial or kind of the salaried publishing employee side of it as on the writer side of it too. I'm, I'm again, I'm sure, but um, mm -hmm. you know, I think it's a double-edged sword doing, doing something that being in an industry that you are passionate about. And I think mm -hmm. publishing runs on a lot of that passion mm -hmm. and it can create very unbalanced, you know, like just, you know, work situations like unbalanced, like work-life balance, you know, like mm -hmm. salaries are still on the lower end across publishing. And, you know, it's kind of a systemic endemic issue um, because I think, again, a lot of people pursue it uh, because they are passionate about it. Um, and again, just double-edged advantages and disadvantages there. Um, but of course that is also, you know, maybe not a blessing, but it is, it does still feel unique to kind of work in an industry that you do have such a personal relationship with, or that you feel really good about generally speaking, um, putting books out in the world. It's just a very singular thing to do, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but again, it has its, you know, 
advantages and disadvantages with regards to the passion. Um, and then of course, there are just, again, a lot of systemic issues in publishing that, um, you know, from just an equity standpoint mm -hmm. that do, they still feel like they're just perennial issues that aren't really being addressed on, mm -hmm. you know, a uh, corporate level or, you know, just an industry wide level. Um, on the plus side, you know, again, like, I don't really get to see readers interacting with our books. Like on the, on, I think on, on our end, it's like a little bit more rare. Like we're not, we're not doing face to face stuff that often, but when we do get a chance to, it is so rewarding. Um, and I know sometimes hearing direct reader feedback can be touch and go um, if they have negative feedback, but overall, especially with like actual real life teen readers, it is so, so cool to see like, yeah how a book has impacted their life or just that they enjoyed reading it. I mean, really, like, I don't think a book has to distill a major life lesson, especially to kids. Like, I don't think that's necessary. Um, I think entertaining them and engaging them is like enough in and of, you know, in and of itself. So that's always really, really a cool side of the industry. But yeah, any mm -hmm. industry that I think mixes art and business is going to be really complex. And, mm -hmm. you know, again, just be, can create like, on balance situations. Right, right. Yeah. And, and you brought this up, but I was just thinking how, how special it is that you get to work with the books that if you were a teen today, that might have been the book that makes you, made you go, I want to go into publishing. Yeah. Like you get to facilitate this experience for someone else. That's like, yeah. that's just really special. Yeah, I hope so. That's the goal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And, and Leslie, what are your thoughts had, on that? Yeah, I had this great experience early in the pandemic. I was very depressed. And I went to my indie bookstore um, to buy sympathy cards because a lot of my friends' parents had died. <laughs> and um, I went to, you know, hand over my credit card. And the cashier knew my book and had read it when I was a kid. <laughs> when she was a wow. kid, sorry. She read my book, one of them, when she was a kid. And I was her favorite author. And it was crazy. And it was like a very depressing, hard, emotional time. And it was just like such a great, bright light in that. And then the person standing behind me offered to take our picture, which was so sweet. <laughs> um, it was just fun and exciting. And I, this, as uh, Alexa said, and I agree with her completely, everything she said, and I kind of started from a different place, but came to the same point and wrote this down because it is such an important issue. But uh, the bright side I think of publishing is I love working with smart people who love books. And it's an amazing when a publisher, you know, when you have an editor who loves your work and you can work with them and they can make the book so much better and they stay at the publishing house for the few years that it takes for the book to actually come out <laughs> and other people, you know, get behind the book. And very often there's a lot of transition and, you know, your book kind of disappears and it, it's depressing when you put so much into something and then you feel like you're publishing into a, a, vo a void. And then um, lately I'm very worried about self-censorship and publishers' censorship and mm -hmm. the political climate and publishers shying away. I mean, I think publishers have done an amazing job of bringing in new voices and recognizing the issues of equity and doing what they can to address them. Or, you know, anyway, it's a start. I think recognizing it is, is, is a start and there, there's a lot, you know, more that needs to be done. But I feel like it's in the works and it's better, you know, than it was 20 years ago. But I worry about self-censorship and shying away from certain topics because of book bans. And yeah, it's hard yeah. because publishing is a business, as Alexa said, but books are about ideas and books are art. And I think reading inspires empathy and it's vital and it really makes the world a better place. But there's been this strange cultural shift and it just seems like so many adults are scared of books now and ideas and they want to shelter kids and they feel like it's okay to do that because it's, you know, they're protecting children and it's terrifying because the adults are wrong. <laughs> and I feel like the, the, you know, sometimes it's like the loud outrageous people who are getting the attention and are getting on the news and, and are getting a platform and, and it's doing a lot of damage. So I'm worried about yeah. that. So, yeah, that, yeah. Um, it is very scary what's happening mm -hmm. to school libraries Yes. And yeah. yeah. And yeah. that's a big market and publishing is a business. So if you're right. you know, the CFO of a publishing house and you know, you have this book that's this great new voice that, you know, is a topic that would, you know, mean a lot and it would be great, you know, an eye opening for lots of kids. And, you know, if it's a business decision, then it may not get published, you know. Right, right, right. Thank you. Thank you for your thoughts on that. Mm -hmm. Um my next question, um, so Alexa works with teens and Leslie works with mostly middle schoolers. Yes. Uh, writes for mostly middle schoolers. And um, I, Leslie, let's start with you. Um, okay. What drew you to that demographic? What makes you I, I mean, schoolers? 
I was a shy, awkward, quiet kid who was like, you know, reading instead of hanging out at lunch <laughs> and reading at recess. And um, I fell in love with reading then and kind of fell into children's books. I didn't think that's where I was going to end up, but that's where the opportunities were for me. And I really love it. And I feel so lucky and it's, it's energizing and exciting and fun. And um, I just, you know, books have always been a safe space for me. And as a quiet kid, it was like great to, you know, kind of learn a lot about the world without having to actually speak to anyone. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah on, on my side, um, I, like I said, I'd always like, I had been pursuing an MFA um, in actually literary translation and I'd always been mm -hmm. interested in books. And I had also always, you know, my previous jobs had, had actually involved either teaching writing to kids or working in classrooms in a different capacity and then I realized I was able to combine those two things. So, um, and also just, you know, like kid lit in general, teens are just, I mean, I, I don't know. I just feel like they're a lot smarter than adults, generally speaking. And just, I, I really don't have like a very rational answer to this, to this question. It's just like, I think they're awesome and they're yeah. like badass and they're smart and um, really just dynamic. And, and I think that the kid lit space is just really, really fascinating and interesting. And and I, I actually do work on the adult side a little bit as well. So I get a little bit of that too, which is actually a very unique kind of position to have within publishing itself. So I'm thankful for that. Right, right. Yeah. Even what is a YA book and what an A book sometimes is like a very flimsy line. Yeah, it, it's it's off. It's very arbitrary. Is sometimes is a lot of things in publishing are, which is also sometimes a fr frustration and sometimes a good thing. I mean, again, I do work for. I'm very proud of working kind of in indie publishing because I think we do have a lot more flexibility and can take a lot more quote unquote risks. I, I use that with a big you know qualification um, on what we do publish um, and what you know what books we're, we're, we're moving forward with and putting into the market. And I do think indie publishing has a really special role in that across genres, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Um, and this is my craft question for the evening. So Alexa, so when you're working with a writer and they're not a teenager, mm -hmm. how do you help the author sound authentic when they're writing about and two teens. Yeah, I, I or is authenticity authenticity even an issue for you? Yeah, that that's the thing. It's a honestly, it's a really like loaded and 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 like broad term. It means yeah. a lot of different things to a lot of different people, and like that is something like conceptually. I would also just like push back on in sure. editing in general is like it's kind of, it's a really catch all term. And I think it's tough to pin it down. So I, it's not that I don't think about it or a variation of it. Um, and on a very, very minute level, it also goes with, you know, like my gut in, se in the sense of like, mostly about like diet, like literally from a craft perspective dialogue. Like if there's a word that I'm like, this feels like a term that I would use. And, and if I'm like, I'm using it, I mean, I might, I look a little bit on the kind of like, I kind of have a baby face, but I'm not, I'm far away from being a teenager. You know what I mean? So I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, if I'm using that word, I wonder if a teenager would say it. And I will just ask the question. I hope I develop enough of a rapport with my writers um, that I feel like I can ask questions and they, you know, it is a genuine question. It's not like a leading question. It's not a demand. It's like, I'm asking you to think about this with me and we can decide together whether or not it's like authentic. But I find yeah. in the sense of just like talking to teenagers, like emotional authenticity, quote unquote, mm -hmm. is more important. Like, does the emotion make sense for this character? Because like, you know, obviously I think there are broad things that do, do you, does characteristics that unite like the genre or like, writing for any group of people specific demographic but people are different and they have different experiences and mm -hmm. they always do you know like and that includes teenagers um right. mm -hmm. so I, I like to treat it more on the level of just like here's the character here's the situation here's their voice um does it feel like it's all authentic and consistent within like the system of the book itself. Mm -hmm. um, so, but yeah, but yeah, if there's like an expression that I'm like, well, that sounds like I would say it, it like literally just on a dialogue level, I will point something out. But um, mm -hmm. that's like very, very line edity and very small. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Yeah, I loved your um, approach to that question because there are there are a lot of ways to do it. Like line edity, literally the words you're using or just from the approach that I, this is character is is a teenager it doesn't make them 
uh, need to dab and like do yeah. TikTok dances. <laughs> like, you know, you approach it like you would any other, yes. any other literary pursuit. Yeah. And I do, you know, in a way that I hope helps, you know, I do question myself a lot. Like if I am, if I'm ever like, oh, they would never say this. I'm like, well, I don't know. Maybe I should take a step back and mm-hmm. check myself, you know? Um, but yeah, 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 it's, and also, you know, again, I don't, I don't really think that someone needs to, a reader needs to see every single aspect of their life literally put on the page to feel like it's, you know, Mm -hmm. applies to them or it's relevant to them. So um, yeah, that's why I always go back to kind of this emotional authenticity question is like, does that feel real? Does it feel real? And if it does, then teens can relate to that. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Um, Leslie, what are your thoughts on authenticity, especially how it relates to writing for middle schoolers? Right. I mean, I um, listen to kids very carefully. I observe. I have a really strong memory. I read what they read. I watch what they watch. And I I just try to, you know, kind of figure it out and sort of channel, you know, (laughs) my inner 11 year old, I guess. And Yeah. yeah, sometimes I get in trouble. I do have kids. And I remember in first grade, my son said something that was so funny. And he looked at me and he was like, you can't use that in your book. So and I haven't yet, but I wrote it down. I still have it. And so, but um, yeah. Great, great. And I also try not to, you know, like write about anything that's like, you know, too much of a, of a fad or, you know, something small or, you know, sometimes I'll make things up. And like, you know, 10 years ago, I mentioned a Katy Perry song and my editor actually wrote like, oh, you know, no one listens to this song anymore. What about this one? <laughs> Like, okay. (laughs) Yeah, if there's like a constellation of like very specifically dated things, that sometimes I'll be like, look, maybe we're drawing from your experience. (laughs) Yeah, and also books take a really long time to come out. You know, it's like that's that's an issue. It's on the bookshelf if I'm lucky. So you know, things change very fast. (laughs) That's true. Especially in, yeah, it's like also teen readers, like, or kid le- readers, even they roll over every couple of years, you know what I yeah. mean? Like, yeah. if it, it doesn't take that long to, you know, age up into adult reading. So yeah. tough, fast moving. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Um, Leslie, you mentioned that you read what kids read. What are some authors, books, oh, other forms of media in your uh, space that we should keep an eye out for. Yeah. So I recently read Caprice by Co Booth, which was amazing. This is a middle grade novel. And Kendra, uh, sorry, Kendra was another middle grade novel. Tyrell is her first book. That's incredible. Um, and I just love her work. Um, I recently heard Jerry Craft speak at my kid's school. And I'm a huge fan of New Kid and Class Act. And I'm really excited for his new book to come out. Um, Front Desk by Kelly Yang, I loved. And then she has a bunch of books now, Key Player. I still need to read, but I'm excited for it. I've heard it's good. My son read it. And then um, From the Desk of Zoe Washington by Janae Marks was incredible. I loved it. Um, 54 Things Wrong with Gwendolyn Rogers, I also really loved. Um, Best about a character with ADHD. Um, Free Lunch is a memoir by Rex Ogle, which is incredible. Um, beautiful. I loved it. And then, um, I'm almost done. <laughs> Rebecca said, I love, and this book, I love in particular, um, the list of things that will not change. So awesome. and we should turn that into a rubric. Like we should turn that into a syllabus. <laughs> <laughs> no, Leslie, I'm not, it, impressive recommendations. And I, I said this before, you know, a little mm-hmm. insight into, into what's going on with my life right now is I said, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm actually my parents' house, so I don't have my library on me right now. Yeah. Um, but also front desk, amazing book. Um, Rex Ogle too. Love yeah. those. Books. I actually, I love, I don't work, unfortunately I don't work with middle grade, uh, but mm-hmm. I love reading middle grade. Yeah. Um, it takes a special author to write middle grade, mm-hmm. but um, I was going to shamelessly plug some Soho teen books. Um, oh, yeah. Because yeah. The list coming up, I had to limit it to what's coming up in the next mm-hmm. year, but, and unfortunately I, I don't have them on me, but I did mention um, what's coming to me by Francesca by the, uh, one, one of the things about my job is, or my specific, our, what we do at Soho is I don't really necessarily have a mandate in the way that other people, other editors do it, maybe larger houses or, you know, something where they're publishing like a more restrictive list. Um, so I always kind of look at my books as like opportunities to do something a little bit different just in terms of plot, pace, you know, character, all that kind of stuff. So I'm proud to have a really like uh 
really interesting kind of mix of books. And so coming up in the next year, literally the next 365 days, I have a book called Ride or Die by Gail Agnes Muzikovanu. Um, it's an awesome story that is kind of like an updated updated nerve by Jean Ryan, which is a little bit of an older comp, but it has kind of this fun thrillery truth or dare element, but like really, really grounded and actually like speaking of authenticity, like it's not very high, it's high stakes emotionally, but it's like things that actual kids would do um, in real life. Um, and it's awesome. It's told from the perspective of um, the a character named Lily Crawford, who is just like actually the best mix of like, like a couple of different characters from Clueless. So it has like a, this kind of really interesting, like 2000s, 90s, uh, like rom-com vibe, but in the body of this like contemporary YA book. And there's an anonymous correspondence involved. It's so much fun. Um, and then coming up, uh, a thriller. Uh, <laughs> oh, sorry, Leslie, go ahead. It's a great title. Yeah. Oh my God. Right. Yes. Ride or die. Mm -hmm. It's in the, I wish I had the cover to show you because that's gorgeous yeah. too. Um, and then we're sorry, really quickly, no one left, but you Take coming you out in the fall. That's by an amazing writer named Tash McAdam. Um, it is a, a, it is a murder mystery um, told in kind of alternating before and after that centers a trans uh, teen named Max. And I won't give away too much, but he's such a compelling character and there should just be, you know, more uh, more published by trans authors in the genre space specifically. So I'm really excited about that one. And then in early 2024, a um, another kind of mix of rom-com and then just contemporary way story, um, Skater Boy by Anthony Narada. Um, it's going to be awesome. So sorry. I know I shouldn't shamelessly plug, but I did it anyway because I love all of my books so much. <laughs> no, I love it. Thank you. I'm, yeah. I'm sure we all want to know the projects you're working on. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. And thank yeah, thank you for both of you. Um, I'm going to open up the floor to our audience questions. So I'm going to pop Yona in here to read the questions out for us. Hello, everyone. I am a global events coordinator here, and let's start getting into those questions. So, Leslie, Alexa, I'll throw this one out to both of you, Alexa in particular. Um, what are some resources for learning about the business of publishing? Yeah, that's, that's also a big question. I, I wish I had something really specific off the top of my head. I think I would honestly need to think about it for a while, because unfortunately, I, I sense the maybe frustration in the question, which is that publishing is very opaque. I don't think it's purposefully so. It is just a kind of a big industry and all of the resources are geared towards, I think, kind of what you want to do in publishing. So for example, there's a lot of uh, sites and newsletters for people who want to learn more about agenting, for example, or how that works. Um there are specific kind of websites for writers who are querying or who are pursuing that track. Um, I'm sorry, I'm actually blanking. Maybe come back to me because I'm blanking on a specific, I wish there were a one, a kind of a one-stop shop and I just cannot come up with it. But maybe Leslie, you have an idea that I don't. <laughs> yeah. No, it's hard. I mean, yeah. I guess people get a lot of information from Twitter these days and that's like a real thing of, you know, <laughs> Lots of editors and agents are on it, I guess. And there's a lot of information and a lot of discussion. So I guess that's one place. And I mean. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I'm seeing right now, too, there's a specific contracts question. Listen, mm -hmm. I would love that resource if anybody has it. No, I'm mostly kidding. <laughs> yeah. But it's another thing that it's just, unfortunately, I think a lot of people, you know, develop knowledge through hands-on experience, which shouldn't mm -hmm. be the way it, it, it should be. But yeah, like Leslie said, like, I'm just going to plug a very specific newsletter, which is an agent that we work with, Kate McKean, who mm -hmm. has actually like a Substack newsletter, and she goes over some really right. specific topics. But I think there are a lot of those out there. I think, um, I feel like it was especially during COVID where I think newsletters became really popular, this really tailored yes. specific advice. So I think if you do a little shopping around, you can find some of those out there, um, kind of specific people just sharing their experience, mm -hmm. honestly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question, first and foremost, because I know um, I've seen a lot of those on social media. There's, It feels like nowadays we have more resources that are more public, but it's so hard to narrow down exactly what it is that we need in order to fulfill something. But I think that's a great transition into our next question. Again, I'll field this to both of you. 
How can we as either writers or consumers push back against censorship? Yeah, Leslie, I went first, so I don't I don't want to I don't want to. I mean, I would say, you know, buy books, check out books in the library, uh, be vocal about things and write what you want to write and just just be out there, you know. Yeah, I think I think I'm part political. of it. You know, yeah, sorry, oh, I'm sorry. much more political, you know, <laughs> around this issue. So in terms of, you know, postcarding and, you know. Yeah, sorry. I was I was just going to add on and say I think I think part of it it's like it does feel so big and so unwieldy. It is really overwhelming to think of like what can be done. I mm -hmm. I've been trying lately to think of that as like not necessarily a positive thing, but as in like okay, there is a lot to be done. I don't think there's mm -hmm. one answer, and I think it's going to have to be like a huge group effort. Um, mm -hmm. On the on the actual industry side, you know, I, I would say I I hope this day doesn't come. I I, I really don't think and hope it won't. But on, on the editorial acquisition side, there's absolutely no talk of, oh, we shouldn't publish this because it's going to get banned. Like that's not at all, you know, maybe in a somewhat naive way, not factoring into decision making at all. Mm -hmm. At least, you know, I can only speak to my own experience. Um, I certainly hope that's not the case for anyone. I mean, imprints have different, again, mandates in different places where they, you know, investors, not investors, literally, I mean, like stakeholders or decision makers or gatekeepers really involved. But I'm, I'm happy in, in to say that certainly like, again, on the acquisition side, that's not a factor in conversation. Um, and that would be very alarming. <laughs> um, that would be very bad, but, yeah. um, on the, you know, on the consumer side, it's tough. Like Leslie said, like keep buying books. Um, unfortunately, that's like the weird thing about art and business is like some of the answers are like they involve money, which like not everyone has access to. So library requests, um, things like that are really important. Mm -hmm. And it seems like I'm by me, like no means an expert in, in, in politics or kind of uh, anything related to civic, uh, you know, uh, civic duties, et cetera. But, you know, participating, I think a lot of these challenges are coming at a local level. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, showing up or just being aware, I think, of what's happening at your library, specifically in, in schools. I think that's tougher right. probably when you don't have kids in schools, but I think mm -hmm. there's always a way. Yeah, sorry, Leslie. And voting, you know, school board elections. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Everybody, so, you know, and, and people really have to pay attention to all that. Yeah, because Leslie, like you said earlier, it's like, seems like the loudest person in the room is like the one with the voice, unfortunately. So hopefully those can be uh, drowned out, to be honest with you, if I can just not mince words. Like, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, we, we do. And, and even on the publisher side, again, I'm sure it's a lot different because publishers do look really different. They vary just in how they, you know, how they're run, how they're organized. But, you know, it's, it's sometimes, you know, like I don't even... In, no, because these things are happening on such a specific like level is like, you know, we don't receive notification that our book's been banned somewhere unless we come across it organically um, or are looking for it. So it's really hard to keep on top of. Um, mm -hmm. And even that feels like a challenge, but it's, it's important to do so. Mm -hmm. um, we have a couple books on our list that have shown up, you know, on a couple of those banned school lists. And it's, yeah, it's, it's awful. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Rachel. That was a very great suggestion in the chat. <laughs> the Society of Children's Book Writers, of course, mm -hmm. illustrators. Yes. Oh, that's great. Thank you, Rachel. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Alexa, if you don't mind, I'm going to tie in your response to this other question. So on this topic of finding out about books, um, we all know now, obviously, teens and, of course, younger kids as well are all on social media nowadays. Um, and Leslie, feel free to jump in as well. Do either of you think that social media has affected or influenced the kinds of stories that kids or teens are wanting to read about? Gosh, um, I don't I don't know. You know, I, I don't know. I'm not sure. I, I was going to say I think we know how it's affecting publishing and marketing in certain ways. But has it affected the, the things that they want to read about? You know, I think. And again, speaking of authenticity, I'm like, I'm not sure I'm going to provide a good answer to this because I'm like, I'm like, I'm not a teen on social media. So I'm not really sure how they're interacting with it, like on a direct mm -hmm. level. But I, I would think and it seems to be true that there's a lot more exposure happening just to mm -hmm. like, you know, that is a source to discover new books. Um, so hopefully it is broadening what they're seeing and are interacting with. And, and that's good, again, especially for teens, like 
who maybe do live in an area where like they're not seeing a very wide array of books on their library shelves or their school shelves. Like mm -hmm. I, I would hope that it's a net positive of like they mm -hmm. can have access safely to a space where they're seeing a lot of different books being promoted. Um, you know, queer books are books that represent their identity in some way that they might not again have access to. I, that's my hope. Mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not, you know, I'm not entirely 100% sure on that, you know. I think mean, book talk is exciting. And I know of an author who, you know, she had a big book, but then, you know, it kind of died down. And then two years later, suddenly, you know, it became a huge thing because of book talk, which is cool and exciting. And yeah, I would agree. I think it's great that, you know, kids can be exposed to more and find out about more books. And there's something very authentic about, you know, TikTok and teens actually generating this content and talking about what they, they truly love. You know, they're not gonna, they're not paid advertisers. Um, but I think it does, like, my reading habits have changed. And I've noticed with kids, it's changed a lot, too. And, you know, my, I try to write shorter chapters and more exciting chapters these days, because people don't have the attention span that they used to. And reading is different. So, and you are competing against, you know, a really cool, flashy, exciting video that's, you know, three seconds. So, <laughs> yeah. So, in that vein, actually, Leslie, let's dive into the next question. And, Alexa, this one's for you as well. So, Leslie, what are some current trends that are in the middle grade market uh, right now? And, Alexa, what are trends happening in YA? Mm -hmm. Trends. I, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I really don't know the answer to that. So I've kind of, you know, I live far away from New York and the publishing industry and I've just been, you know, writing what I want to write and, and hoping that people want to read it. Um, I don't know. I hope my agent knows. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm going to have a very warm and fuzzy answer. Oh, sorry, yeah. Leslie. Sorry. No, I, I'm I'm used to right Zoom right. where you see like the box pop yeah. up where it's like this person's talking. So sorry. Apologies. Go okay. ahead. Go ahead. I think I'm done. Oh, no, I, I was going to have like a warm and fuzzy and equally kind of like ambiguous answer, because I think that's another concept in publishing that takes up a lot of space, but that actually like is honestly, you know, more of a gut feeling, which mm -hmm. can be really counter uh, constructive, you know, to 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 acquiring you know, to acquiring or very limiting. And again, I guess, sorry, I keep on like getting on the soapbox, but I again feel lucky where like I work for a smaller publisher that, you know, we publish books that um, we like, we don't have pressure on us really to like trend mm -hmm. chase or things like that. Yeah. Um, but my warm and fuzzy answer was going to be, I think there's a less clear answer because I think the idea of like trends in, in children's lit or YA specifically has like exploded, you know, like in a good way where it's like, there's a lot of really, uh, a lot of like uh, books do really well, but like mix genres or like mm -hmm. books that are doing more than one thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's awesome. Like it's really, I think there's a lot of books on the market right now that like might not have been on the market like five or six years ago even, um, and are getting published because they have a unique vision and are just really textural and just different, you know? Um, and, you know, my, my only answer actually would be really that there's a lot of horror out there right now. And I think mm -hmm. that's really cool. And I hope that's, that stays. Um, mm -hmm. And I think there's a little bit more of an appreciation for it um, and interest in it, but I don't know. I mean, again, maybe it's naive, but like, I think that kind of this idea of one thing dominating the market is like not really the model anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe part of that has to do with social media. I honestly, I'm going to be talking about things that I don't really, you know, know about, you know, but mm -hmm. I think part of that is like, you know, that consumers do seem to have a bigger voice. And of course, like that voice reflects a lot of different interests. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and it makes sense. Like you were saying earlier, everything on the internet nowadays is always an open conversation. Yeah. So yeah. you're totally right about that. Um, and hopefully this question isn't uh, too vague as well, but in terms of tips, so from both the editorial side and from the author side, uh, to anyone who's aspiring to either become a publisher or become an author, uh, what would your advice be to them? What would you say to them? I would say read a lot and write what you would want to read and read your work out loud and make sure it's exciting to you. And if it is and it's authentic, it'll be exciting to other people. I, I think, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah, reading a lot. I mean, that is, yes. I it, Again, it seems like a 
straightforward like of course you do that but like you have to take the time to do it and kind of like be you know like you know apply yourself to like studying essentially and that sounds a little crass but like it's true and I think it's fun also um for editorial specifically I would say there is there is a pretty even though mine wasn't so clear like there's a pretty clear on like career path to editing and and usually generally it is like getting a job as an editorial assistant and being promoted in that way. Like it's a pretty narrow ladder. Mm -hmm. Um, Unfortunately, I think it would be nice to see that change a little bit, but that's my very practical, straightforward answer. However, you know, I think a lot of people when they think about publishing, don't think of like kind of there, there is a broader, there is a broader um, uh, types of job to get in publishing. So people don't think about working in sales all the time. I worked in publicity for a while. It was really interesting speaking of like the business side of publishing in marketing. Um, So, you know, if you're just interested in publishing and don't have your heart set on one particular path, I would definitely suggest exploring what those entry level jobs look like. And even though it is tough, it is possible to move between departments. You know, if you are, if you do have a, you know, end up gravitating more towards something different than what you started in. Um, yeah. Or agenting, I think being, you know, an assistant at the literary agency, you yeah. see a lot and understand a lot and learn a lot. So, yeah. And again, and again, I'm sorry to keep beating the drum, but like, I feel really, I feel like working at a smaller place. Like I feel like yeah. at least I have been exposed to every single aspect of publishing, except maybe, um, you know, like the bigger like school library sales, like for example, mm-hmm. we don't have these huge departments, but that's been really, really interesting too. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. And Leslie, I'm gonna throw this one at you. So since you're working with, you know, middle school kids, yeah. has there ever been an instance where, you know, a kid reader has reached out to you? Like have they written a letter? Well, Is that- yes. It- and I love that. It's my favorite thing. Yeah. I get tons of it. Well, I used to have an office with a and then a PO box, so I would get actual letters, which was really fun. But I so that shut down during the pandemic. So now I just have email on my website. But I hear from readers all the time and it's really great. I love it. So cool. <laughs> yeah. It's one of my favorite parts of the job. So so we have one more question, which I think puts us in a good spot. Um, okay, let's do one more and then we can get you guys out of here. So Alexa, and again, Leslie, feel free to jump in as well. Um, what would you say are the benefits between traditional publishing versus self-publishing? Because I know that's a pretty uh, common question that a lot of people have when it comes to publishing 101s and the general questions. Yeah, I guess, you know, again, I can only speak to like our, our side of it, which is the traditional publishing, even if it's like indie publishing, indie publishing, indie, indie publishing is still traditional publishing as, as far as I understand it. I usually in, in the way that it's used, but I mean, the really simple answer that I can, that I would say is that in, when you self publish, you have complete control over your own work. You have control um, with your cover, you have control with editorial, you have control over I assume like how much it's going to cost, how you want to sell it, all of those things. And for some people, and and also, you know, understandably, like that is a huge advantage. You know, you're mm-hmm. not waiting to query an agent. You're sorry. You're not wearing, you're not waiting to get represented. You don't have to go through the submission process. Mm-hmm. Um, you really do, you know, aside from the fact that you have to work with certain companies or certain distribution, like you do have control. Um, so, you know, that is something that a lot of people, a lot of writers don't have in, in, in when they publish, you know, traditionally. Um, of course, like the plus side is, you know, with traditional publishing is that you have a team, um, presumably, and, um, you know, it, it's kind of a, it is a, it is more of a team effort and you have access to like some of the bigger institutions that a lot of people who self pub don't, you know, like being sold in, in widely in bookstores, for example, um, things of that nature. So I think at the end of the day, it's just a choice about, you know, that involves your own relationship to your work and what you want for it. Um, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you, Alexa. And actually Kennedy, if it's okay, we do have one last question this time. So one more final question. Um, and again, I will field this one to both of you. So are there any tips for new authors looking for agents? 
Um, when I first found my first agent, I did not know what I was doing. And I Googled everyone. I got like 10 of my favorite books or books that I admire for some reason and looked at who people thanked in the acknowledgements and Googled those people until I found some agents and cold called them. And that actually worked. Um, but SCBWI is a great place to, I think, meet agents and learn about that process. And yeah, but I would say, you know, like, if you have a book that's done and you're looking for an agent, like find 10 to 20 books that are similar in some way and figure out, and a lot of that information is just available online. You don't, you know, you can figure out who the yeah. agents are. And um, yeah. And, if, and for the, for the research end, there is, there is a seat. Now I have a resource to recommend, which I hope is, <laughs> actually, I hope is useful, but it's the MS, MSWL website. I think it's, mm -hmm mswishlist.com, some, something like that. It'll be easy to find. It'll pop up if you Google it. Um, mm -hmm. That has editors and agents on it. Sometimes I actually get emails, I'll, I get, you know, because I'm on there listed as an editor for people looking for literary representation and I have to redirect, but it is a very comprehensive database of literary agents. Um, it's, it's pretty clear how to like select for what you want mm -hmm. and you can search keywords, you can search genre, you can search age range, all of those things. Um, and I think that, again, Leslie, I've never been through this process myself. So I'm talking a little mm -hmm. bit out of school, but, you know, it is a long process, generally speaking. Yeah. And it does involve, again, for the most part, like assume it involves a lot of patience, but like, mm -hmm. I would also say if I can just, you know, I guess give a little personal advice is I think the same should be true on your end too, in the sense of like, that is a really important relationship and, and you need to find the person who's right for you. And sometimes that involves, you know, turning down an offer of representation. If like you have a conversation with someone and it doesn't seem like your best, they have your best interest at heart or it's just not a good fit. Like yeah. think, think about it too, is like, you're also kind of interviewing someone. I know that's hard to say when it's like, you know, a lot of people in the querying process will send out 40 queries and get five responses and that's pretty normal and even maybe high. So yeah. it's, it's, I think, hard to probably maintain that perspective that, you know, there it, it will be this person's job to represent you and and have your best interests at heart and understand your book um, mm -hmm. and understand you as a writer and what you want from your career. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think it's okay that the, the, the time it takes can also benefit the writer and should benefit the writer in the long yeah, run. That's really good advice. Yes, there are a lot of amazing agents out there. So, you know, yeah. it does take a lot of time to, you know, it's a very slow process. Yeah. And it is totally okay. Like there's a lot of and things. You're the wrong agents for the wrong, you know, for the yeah. right author. I mean, yeah. No. Yeah, no, totally, totally. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean, you know, fit is a real thing. And it's kind yeah. of like, again, kind of a gut thing. But also, like, I think a lot of do, do if you're out querying, like, think about your career as a whole and your next projects down the line, and not mm -hmm. only the book that you're out on, you know, that you're querying. Um, yeah. Thank you both. Thank you. Answer. Mm -hmm. Thank you to everyone who sent in those questions. Those were all really great questions. So Thank you all. Kennedy, I'll throw it back to you. All right. Yeah, I just wanted to thank Alexa and Leslie one last time. That was a wealth of information. Um, I'm just so glad I got to facilitate this panel and mm -hmm. ask all, everything I was curious about. Yeah. So um, thank you, everybody in, in the chat and watching tonight. Thanks for attending. Um, you can continue to connect with uh CMA members at the directory that I dropped in the chat earlier tonight. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you for being a member of CMA. And we hope to see you at the next meetup on Thursday, April 20th. And I will release Alexa and <laughs> Leslie now. <laughs> thank, <laughs> thank you so much. much. Yeah, it was great. Bye. Good night. Good night. Good night.